good afternoon, everyone. So you're here today with Teach First, and we're going to be um, discussing and celebrating the Windrush era, um, talking very much about uh, the history, but also the current day um, situation with regards to the scandalous Windrush scandal. Um, so please do um, put your name and your role, where you're um, joining us from in the comments. Um, if you have any specific questions, um, there is a Q&A. Um, so again, if you could put your questions in the sidebar, um, we will get to those in a moment. So welcome everybody. I'm Joanne Benjamin Lewis. I'm from Teach First. I'm a curriculum and training lead. And in my uh, former roles, I was a vice principal, assistant head, and my subject area is English. My parents were from the Windrush generation. So today is a very special day. Um, and uh, actually we talk very much about their experiences all the time. My parents are great in terms of um, sharing stories and I've learned so much about that particular era. But today um, we are very, very blessed to have with us Dr. Amma Binney, who has over 25 years teaching experience in the fields of Caribbean and African history and politics. She's also taught courses in African-American history. She's published author, um, The Political and Social Thought of Kwame Nkrumah. And she is also an editor of a Pan-African weekly electronic newsletter. She's currently an independent scholar. And so this afternoon, I'd love to welcome you, Dr. Anna, to talk to us about um, the Windrush, the history, and uh, the important significance of this generation. Welcome. And thank you very much, um, Joanne, for that introduction. And I'd also like to say thank you very much to Charlene Wilkinson, um, a former student protege of mine that I'm extremely, wonderfully, fabulously proud of in terms of how far she's come in her, her journey, career journey specifically. Um, so anyway, let me start. I've only got 10 minutes and unfortunately I'll apologize to you now in advance. I do have to leave around 10 to one. I double booked myself foolishly, um, but let's press ahead. As we're all aware, today marks the 73rd anniversary of the arrival of the ship, the SS Empire Windrush. And it arrived on the 22nd of June this day in 1948 at Tilbury. And it's a historical milestone um, because it marks the first wave in the modern era of West Indians coming to Britain. And I really want to stress um, that prior to the arrival, um, there had been Africans um, on these shores, um, Africans from different parts of the African continent that go back to the Roman times. Um, but that is another story for another time. Now on board the Windrush, um, there were said to be 492 people from different parts of the Af um, West Indian um, islands and the majority of them were women and some were children and all of them had managed to pay the the rather exorbitant um, fare at the time of about 28 pounds and 10 shillings and um, some of them had had borrowed this money from other family members relatives in order to come to the so-called motherland now Britain in 1948 was a very bleak place, apart from the bleak and gloomy weather um, that is still with us. Um, but it was particularly bleak in terms of the physical landscape um, of the country. Um, Britain was merely three years um, after the Second World War that had bombed many cities um, around the country. And therefore, Britain was sorely in need of economic repair and therefore human resources, people were needed to rebuild the country. Now in my um, remaining eight minutes, I want to address um, four questions. And these four questions are, you know, what do we know about the SS Empire Windrush? Um, why did West Indians come to this country? Um, the third question is, where were West Indians initially accommodated um, and what happened to them? And then finally, 
we will address what were their experiences in housing and employment here in this country. In terms of the first question, um, what do we know about the SS Empire Windrush? Um, I think very few people um, are aware of the kind of um, astonishing history of this ship um, itself. Um, very few people are aware that it was originally a German ship that was built in Germany in 1930. And its original name was the MV Monte Rosa. And it was first of all used between 1933 and 1939. It was used as a cruise ship in Germany um, to ferry people around, Germans around on holiday, on cruises. And then it converted itself um, for another function. It was used by the Nazi party um, in 1939 to carry out its invasion of Norway. And then it took um, German soldiers um, into battle um, in regards to the Second World War um, during the invasion of Norway. And then finally in 1945, um, it was captured by the British. But even prior to that, um, it was actually used as well to ferry um, Jewish people to their slaughter at um, Auschwitz Birkenau in southern Poland. So this is a little bit of a very interesting, fascinating history um, about the, um, the ship itself before it was captured by the British and brought West Indians to this country. In terms of why did West Indians come to this country, um, it's very well known that the main reason why they were brought to these shores was to rebuild this country. Um, and many did not plan to stay for very long. They just planned to accumulate you know, money um, in order to go back to the Caribbean. And many of them were, were skilled people, highly skilled people. And we know this from looking at the passenger records on board the SS Empire Windrush and it lists the various skills of these people who were on board. For example, there were 85 mechanics, there were 54 carpenters, 39 clerks, 34 tailors, 24 welders, 20 engineers, 18 cabinet makers, and many more. The list goes on. I won't um, um, bore you with, with, with the skills, but just to emphasize, they were you know, skilled people. Um, and so therefore, the, the people who arrived um, in Britain between 1949 and 1971 from the Caribbean had been named, um, they had been labeled the Windrush generation. Um, in terms of the third question, where were West Indian passengers accommodated in Britain once they arrived? Again, very few people are aware that when they arrived in, in London, in um, Tilbury Docks in 1948, they were first accommodated in an old air raid shelter um, in London. And within a month, all but 12 of them had found jobs around the country. Um, 296 of them are said to have remained in London um, and others moved to places such as um, Wolverhampton, Coventry. Um, I'm very much aware that Sir Lenny Henry, um, his parents, um, think from, well, they were from Dudley. Um, so they moved up there. Many people moved to Liverpool, Manchester, Colchester, Bristol, Plymouth, Leeds, Bolton. So, you know, there were specklings of um, people of um, Caribbean descent all over um, the UK. A very important part of this historical story um, that has implications for the, the, the recent um, Windrush scandal is that whilst the SS Empire Windrush was traversing the Atlantic um, in the summer of 1948, the British Parliament passed the British Nationality Act um, and what this law did was to ensure that people of the British Empire had the right um, to enter and live in Britain. Um, and it ensured that people in Britain also had the right to travel um, to the empire and to um, settle in the empire itself. 
But we have to remind ourselves that when the, the British government and British officials were um, um, cultivating, nurturing, introducing this law, in their minds, they were thinking of people from the white Commonwealth or what was called the white Commonwealth or the white dominions, countries such as um, the former racist uh, minority settler regime of South Africa, um, New Zealand and Australia. These are the countries that they initially um, believed and wanted the British Nationality Act to, to cover. They were not thinking about black bodies. Um, but ironically, um, the British Nationality Act um, gave the same rights to brown and black bodies of um, the, the West Indies and Africa, just as it gave the same rights um, to white bodies from the, the so-called um, old Commonwealth. So in other words, the um, Windrush generation, um, they were covered by the British Nationality Act. Um, and therefore they had full rights to, to work and live um, in Britain. In regards to my um, final question, what were their experiences in, in housing and employment? In short, the, the Windrush generation experienced acute racism. You know, many believed, I'm sure um, Joanne may have stories from her, her parents, many believed that the streets were paved with gold. Um, and that was the reason why they were coming to these shores. Um, but it was certainly paved with um, dirt and prejudice. And that's what we can, we can say. Um, in terms of their experiences of housing and employment, um, they experienced what was called at the time the color bar which is essentially racism, you know, racist um, discrimination. Um, and again, many of us um, are aware that um, many were employed in the newly established National Health Service and in London Transport. Um, we also need to remember in this um, fascinating story that um, people of African Caribbean heritage were an extremely resourceful people and they brought with them their cultural practices such as pardna, susu and box. Um, and these were, um, in the context of the Caribbean, they were forms of saving schemes that the Caribbean people resorted to as a form of self-reliance. Um, particularly useful to them or highly useful to them in their new socioeconomic conditions of, of Britain. And what Pardner or Box or Susu allowed Caribbean people to do um, was to buy their own houses. Um, you know, you needed a bulk lump sum of money to put a deposit, you know, then and now um, to buy a house and even to, to buy expensive furniture, such as a, a sofa, a suite, a, you know, a cabinet. Um, and as we know, many of the white banks of the time um, practiced, you know, institutional racism. It wasn't called that at the time, but the color bar and refused to give them loans. And if they did, the loans were highly exorbitant. Um, you know, the, the interest rates rather on the loans were, 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 were very high. And we also know that many West Indians lived in overcrowded rooms. Um, that is beautifully conveyed in Andrea Levy's television adaptation, Small Island. Um, beautiful um, adaptation. And we know that they lived in appalling conditions and they, they were subject to discrimination and economic exploitation by corrupt landlords. One notorious one is I think, Peter Rackman and Rackmanism, um, whereby um, if tenants were behind in their rent, in rent arrears, they could be, there were no forms of um, legislation protecting the rights of tenants as there are now, and they could be turfed out onto the streets. Um, so these were some of the conditions that um, Caribbean people faced. Now by 1958, you know, that is 10 years after the Windrush, um, we know that there were roughly around 125,000 West Indian people living and working in Britain. And during the same time, um, 350,000 Irish people had also migrated to Britain. And, you know, it must be stressed that these two communities, amongst others, um, were all key, were all critical 
to help rebuilding this country after the devastation of the Second World War. Um, and in the historical amnesia um, of this country, again, very few people are aware that um, a very infamous politician by the name of Enoch Powell, long before he made his Rivers of Blood speech, Enoch Powell took a tour of the West Indies and one of the islands that he visited was Barbados. And he was recruiting Bayesian nurses for the National Health Service. So that's a, a key fact, you know, in um, the narrative of racists that they forget to um, remember um, when they hail their, their, their racist figures such as Enoch Powell. And it's also important to remember in this um, story that black people resisted the, the racism, the discrimination, the, the oppression that they experienced. Um, you know, they were not passive objects of, of history. They were not pushed around and they did not um, take the um, discrimination that they, they faced. And therefore we should be very proud of the, the acts of defiance and resistance that they, that they um, carried out. I really don't have time to go into details of resistance, but I'll point out two examples that really stand out. The first example is again, um, um, the Notting Hill and Nottingham um, so-called riots of 1958, um, which really was a case of white people attacking black people. Um, so riots has to be in adverted commas. Um, and the other example is the 1963 um, Bristol bus boycott when West Indians and Asians together organized against the boycott of the local bus, local Bristol bus company. Um, it was led by very young um, Paul Stevenson and it was very successful on the account of the national and local media attention that they brought to the discriminatory practices of the local bus company. And it had to back down and eventually agreed to employ black and Asian workers. Now, even before um, Nottingham and Notting Hill riots, you know, West Indies, again, I want to emphasize, they were very politically active in the 1940s and the 1950s. They campaigned in many pan-Africanist organizations. Again, this tends to be a, a forgotten history that I'm very much at pains to, to um, introduce or to make aware um, to my students that um, in the 1940s and 50s, we have great um, Caribbean figures such as CLR James, George Padmore, Claudia Jones, Amy Ashwood Garvey, campaigning along with continental Africans, such as Kwame Nkrumah, Joe Apia, and many others, and all denouncing the injustices of colonialism and campaigning for freedom and justice um, for all colonial peoples. Um, so this again is something that we should not forget. And really to conclude, um, I'm sure my 10 minutes is up, that, that the history of the, the Windrush generation is a wonderful history. It's a fascinating history, um, but I really plead that we do not see it in isolation um, from the wider contributions and struggles of other African descended peoples who came to, to these shores. Um, continental Africans, you know, who were here also in the 1930s and 40s, as well as in the post-war um, era. Um, the Windrush generation, you know, should be remembered um, because African Caribbeans or people of Caribbean heritage, they certainly helped to put the greats in Great Britain. Uh, and this we should be proud of, and this we should celebrate. And I thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. Um, you perfectly put into context the importance of the Windrush generation um, and um, the significance of this generation, incredibly resilient people who faced, as you described, many, many barriers um, to achievement, but didn't let that stop them, um, the collectiveness. Um, so if they were not welcome in the Church of England, they set up mm. their own church in somebody's front room. Um, they then right. got some more money together to then move into a, uh, a mm. local hall. 
and then built their own churches, built their own um, conference centers. So these are people mm. who, um, as you said, would not um, let uh, the, you know, the barriers which were placed um, to prevent them from being incredibly successful, incredibly resilient. Um, I'm just going to turn to my colleague, Laura, to see if there are any questions for you before you leave us. Um, so we haven't had any questions come through just yet um, on the chat or the Q&A, but um, if anybody does have anything, obviously Dr. Hammer um, has to go, but we said we'll follow up afterwards. So if you do still want to submit questions as your mind ticks over in the next half an hour or so, please, please add those. Well, my quick question, um, there's been quite a number of campaigns around uh, the teaching of Black British history mm -hmm. in schools. Um, like many people, I did not learn any of this history at school. Um, and much of this has only been very through my, in my own research. Um, what are your feelings about um, how we as educators can um, support the campaign um, for more and Black British history to be incorporated in the school curriculum? Um, I think, um, yes, we must, um, you know, fight for or push for more resources um, to, in terms of books, you know, materials to be um, included um, in the, the curriculum. And we must also, educators, um, like yourselves, you know, should also push for, in terms of training of all teachers, regardless of their, their background, white, um, Asian, you know, Eastern European teachers, they must all be trained um, in terms of having an understanding of the, the diverse histories of the children that they, they teach. Um, you know, and that requires, in terms of, you know, training, it requires, you know, resources, money, um, so, you know, these are the things that, um, you know, we, we can do. Um, I'm sure, you know, that there are, there are other things, um, but certainly, yes, in terms of making the curriculum, you know, more diverse, it requires um, us to, you know, re reassess, reevaluate the existing curriculum. Um, and not just in the realms of um, history, I think also in terms of, you know, literature, um, in terms of maths as well, in terms of science. How did other people from other parts of the world, Asian, you know, Asian people contribute towards, you know, science in terms of, you know, gunpowder, I was learning the, the other day. Um, in terms of maths, you know, Pythagoras theorem, um, you know, Pythagoras was um, a Greek um, scholar who learned from the ancient Egyptians. So all these kind of, you know, nuggets and insights can be infused in the entire curriculum. So not just history, it takes a very holistic uh, uh, um, interpretation or approach to, to education in its entirety. And we have to be innovative, we have to be imaginative um, as, as we do this. Thank you very much. I, I love that you focused on the holistic. Um, so history, math, science, English. Um, we at yes. Teach First have a campaign, Missing Pages, which is looking at diversifying uh, the English curriculum, providing resources, opportunities for our colleagues to explore how they can have texts that come um, you know, from a much wider range of people. So mm. really, really important. Um, Laura, um, if there's any other quick question before Dr. Anna leaves us. No, no. Or Not comments? Just, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your contribution today um, to help us celebrate Windrush Day, put the um, actual, all of that into context, the importance of the Windrush generation. Um, mm -hmm. And we just thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. We're definitely going to be having you back again. And, um, and we're now going to um, introduce Dr. Desmond Jadu, um, who is a Windrush campaigner. Um, Dr. Jadu, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Wonderful to see you. Um, so I'm just going to introduce you to everybody. Um, 
As many of you will know, Desmond Jadda is a former Birmingham City Council housing officer and entrepreneur um, interested in music production, marketing, and extensive um, work in various communities in Birmingham and where I'm from Birmingham as well. So we're just gonna pick up all of the Birmingham people here, um, my hometown. And so Desmond is, was born in Birmingham like myself with Jamaican parents, educated in Birmingham and still lives in Birmingham with his family. Um, he is a absolutely ardent Windrush campaigner. He's also um, traveled to Jamaica to support somebody who was um, deported, who was caught up in the scandal. He's recently stood for police and crime commissioner elections and is a passionate activist helping victims and families in and around the West Midlands. Um, a very highly motivated inspirational speaker um, who is a bishop um, also. So um, is it okay for me to call you Desmond? Of course today. it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so I really wanted to invite you here today just to talk about um, all of the wonderful things that Dr. Amma shared in terms of the history of the Windrush. Um, but more importantly, um, what's been happening since many of our um, attendees will know about the Windrush scandal. They may have seen um, last year the, the brilliant adaptation um, sitting in limbo that the BBC um, drama documentary, uh, which showed very poignantly the effects of uh, the changes to immigration acts to our community. So um, I'm just going to give you this opportunity just to talk about some of the work that you've been doing. Um, and really also just a kind of call to us as educators in terms of what we can do, um, sharing the story of the Windrush generation, how we can encourage young people to be involved in activism, kind of what the, the call is for us as educators also. So welcome, Dr. Jaddy. Thank you, Joanna, and good afternoon, everyone. And um, I was actually listening in the car on the way back, and I've just physically arrived back so that I can be on camera with you um, this afternoon. So thank you, and thank you, Joanne, for the kind invitation. Um, one of the most important things we have to remember, um, first and foremost, is that we, the Windrush generation, no matter how you want to look at it, were descendants of people who were British. My parents were born in Jamaica, although my granddad um, came from India and went to Jamaica in the late 1800s. But my father was born in Jamaica, and so was my mother. And both came here with British passports. Now that's quite significant because if you listen to what the government say today, varying home secretaries from Theresa May when she was prime minister, um, we've got Amber Rudd, we also have Sajid Javed, and today we have Priti Patel. And they all say that the Windrush generation are British. The problem is that we have with this is that no one considered the Windrush generation to be British. Now, if we expand on that, this all, the first injustice occurred. And if we focus just on Jamaica, that's where my parents are from. That occurred on the 6th of August, 1962, when Jamaica was granted its independence from Britain. So what happened then was that Alexander Bustamante and Norman Manley at the time, who were the political leaders of either party, they signed away without consultation the British citizenship, the birthright of my parents, our elders. That's what they did. So many people are here in the UK, and despite the British Nationality Act, what happened was these people were already British. They had British passports, but those, those were taken away. Then in 1980, the second injustice occurred. They were actually asked to repurchase what they had in the first place, which was their British passports. Now that's the second injustice from government. Now we're not talking about, and I think though all those other injustices have been eloquently covered already, um, including the attempt to turn around the SS Empire Windrush to, um, take its occupants at the time in June 1948 to Ghana to pick peanuts. But that set the scene of actually what they thought of us 
as black people. I make no bones about this because I do believe that we're all created in God's image and we're all created equally. But clearly there are others who have um, differing views from what my views are and from the views of God as well, um, one could argue. Now, importantly, we all went to school together, we're all friends together, we all work together. Now in 1980, some people said, well, do you know what? I don't want to pay for my citizenship. I am British and that's the end of it. Some people even came here and said that I'm never gonna find a plane, so I don't need a passport. Until Theresa May introduced the hostile environment in 2012, although it started back in 2003 for visas for Jamaicans, a country where the Queen is head of state today, but you need a visa to come to the UK from Jamaica. In 2007, a memorandum of understanding was signed with varying Caribbean governments to ease the deportation of prisoners, and they would call them foreign prisoners, but also as well, a deal was struck to build a prison in the Caribbean where they would house prisoners um, who were convicted by an unjust um, um, criminal justice system in this country. We're not saying people are guilty or not guilty. It's the, we're talking about the proportionality of sentencing. Now, all of this plays an actual part in the issues that we face in this country. Now, in 2012, once the... Um, in 2012, once the, wind, once the hostile environment was implemented, people were asked to prove to their landlords that they're British, prove to their employers they're British. So what I'm going to do, the best thing I can do for you today, Joanne, is to cite, if you look at the Wendy Williams Lessons Learned Review into Windrush, case study number one, a lady from Birmingham called Gloria. Gloria is one of my cases. And this is a case of horrible injustice. Gloria came here in 1970 from St. Kitts. Gloria's mum died within six months of her arriving here. Gloria was brought up by her eldest sister. And because her sister was about 16, she was brought up under the supervision of social services. So hence, that's quite key, isn't it? State involvement. Gloria went to school, got a national insurance number, ended up in 1973, Gloria got a job. And since 1973, right up until 2011, Gloria will continue to work in her job. She worked in the care industry and Gloria was on a very, very decent salary in excess of 20,000 pounds per annum. Gloria got married, had three wonderful children, She's a grandmother as well. They bought a house. They opened a small shop in Birmingham. And then lo and behold, she was tupid across to a new service provider, a new employer. When she was tupid across, they said, we need to do your DBS checks. What then happened was she was asked to produce a passport. They said, well, she said, I haven't got one. They said, you need to have it because we need photographic ID for you. Gloria duly went away and applied for a British passport, told she doesn't, she's got no right to be in this country. And before you know it, she got suspended from work and eventually she was dismissed from her job. She was then placed in poverty row. She just about got some benefits and she spent five years trying to demonstrate that she's British. I met Gloria in 2016, looked at the paperwork. Gloria, when I looked at that paperwork, I said, you're British. There's no issues here whatsoever. I said, look at that. You were taken straight to a doctor because when you arrive here from a foreign country, you have to go register with a GP before you can go onto the school's waiting list, as many people know. Everything was ignored, no passports, um, no passports issued. You're not entitled to be in the country. You may have to leave. Gloria went into a mass state of depression. Um, her hair fell out. Hair went grey. Husband developed prostate cancer and went to stage four. Her daughter dropped out of university. In the end, once the Windrush scandal broke, Gloria, I sent Gloria to Solihull, Hall, which is the local immigration officer, office to Birmingham. And when Gloria went there, within one hour, 
She was given a biometric card, given her right of abode. She was given a form to immediately apply for her British passport. No, sorry, her citizenship, which she did. And that was granted within two weeks. In addition to that, we met Sajid Javid at the House of Commons, who was Home Secretary at the time. And she said, my passport fee has been taken off me two times. By the time she got home, she got a phone call up the passport office asking her to fill in a passport form and her passport was issued free of charge. Question is, why did all of that happen? One hour and the, and the documents that um, she had actually clearly demonstrated every, all the information the Home Office wanted because the GP registration was there. And that's what they used to track all her records. And before you know it, she's now British. Now her journey, has not only lasted the past 10 years, it's still ongoing because of the impact that it's had on her life, an impact putting her through depression, putting the family through severe cancer. Now, why did this happen? Someone who's been here for 40 years, 50 years even, there was no common sense being used in the Home Office. Wendy Williams talks about education, and this is where I'm just going to focus for a few minutes. Education is absolutely key because the people, the staff at the Home Office, were completely oblivious to empire, the Commonwealth. They were oblivious to the fact that people came from the Caribbean to this country to rebuild it. They didn't have a clue. They, the hostile environment educated them in such a way to alienate every single person that went to the Home Office. And this has been cited in the Wendell Williams Review. Now, importantly, it's because of campaign after campaign that ultimately broke the Windrush scandal. And today we have assisted in excess of 1,000 people locally. Our national organization, the Windrush National Organization, which I chair, has assisted in excess of 5,000 people. And we are assisting people currently with their compensation claims, some of which have had um, six-figure settlements. Now, importantly, education. This is one of the mitigating factors the government can put forward, but it's their own fault. Our history and our journey is enshrined in the British Empire, and that is supposed to, that is a story that must be told, and it must be told to our youngsters. At a time when our young people are committing acts of violence towards each other. Sometimes they don't realize, some of them, their grandparents shared the same room. Their grandparents shared the same bed. On the bed system, we've heard about partner. We've heard about um, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. We've heard about the churches. This morning, um, I'm coming from a flag raising ceremony in Birmingham city center. And there was um, David Urquhart, Bishop of Birmingham, and Bernard Langley, the Archbishop of Birmingham. The Roman Catholic Church and the Anglican Church represented. They're represented there because we've started that difficult conversation. Yes, we bought the churches, but now we have to get to this time of truth, reconciliation, healing, and transformation. That's where we need to be now. Take that history, grab the bull by the horns and deal with that history because that needs to be done. And thankfully now we are doing that. We are doing that through an education process, through the churches. We have the Commonwealth Games coming up. We're gonna be working with schools, talking about Windrush heroes, people such as Lord Bill Morris um, from Jamaica, came here as a young man, ended up the leader of the Transport and General Workers Union, for example, one of the largest unions in the country. Also unsung heroes, the heroes, the people who worked in industry, the people who worked at Longbridge in Birmingham building cars, for example, the people who worked right across the automotive industry, the people who worked in the tire industry, the steel industry, the coal industry, so that we can build that educational foundation that permanently, not just on the 22nd of June, but that permanently honors the contribution of the Windrush generation and I'm very sorry, Joanne, it's 10 past one, so I better stop there. Uh, 
Des, I know that you can um, you could talk for much, much, much longer, but that was um, a really very passionate insight into what has happened since um, the injustice um, that has taken place in terms of, you know, as you say, people who came here but very, very young, very small ages, been through the whole school system, paid their taxes, paid their national insurance, um, and then come to find that they have to prove that they have the, the right to stay after 50 years. And I think um, the fact that there are some 5,000 people that you are supporting through your organization um, who are at this moment trying to um, get compensation, um, get their, you know, all of their documents and everything sorted out. You know, we want to thank you and your organization for the work that you tirelessly do. Um, it shouldn't have happened, as we know, in the first place. Um, but it's through the activism of people like yourself supporting others um, that we came to know about this scandal because much of it was going on and it wasn't brought to um, the nation's attention. And also just thank you for your call to educators. Um, it is absolutely crucial that our young people now know um, about the contribution of the Windrush generation um, so that we have better understanding um, to eliminate the chances of anything like this happening um, again in the future. Now we did put a call out um, a little bit earlier to our attendees um, who may have um, a question for you. Um, Laura? Uh, yes, we have a couple of questions. Um, so the first one um, just says thank you so much for the work that you do and um, what do you think future justice looks like for the people who have been impacted? And what role does the government have to play in that? In your if you ask me that question, that opens up a mass kind of worms, as Joanne knows. The injustice is not just about the Windrush scandal, it's about the disproportionalities that we suffer and the, and the ongoing discrimination. Um, I think the previous speaker mentioned the 58 issues in St Anne's in Nottingham, 59 following the murder of Kelso Cochrane in Notting Hill. We look at um, the 1981 SUS laws, which are absolutely crucial as well. We look at the um, 1985 disturbances in Birmingham, and sorry, we can't forget 1973 as well, in Toxter. And then we had obviously uprisings in 2011 as well, and there's been pocket issues, disturbances since then all related to discrimination. That's the point I'm getting at. Now, importantly, what does justice look like? Justice will only ever come when there's a level playing field for everyone. We know that our children have to work twice as hard as anyone else to even succeed sometimes in the education system. We have saw the um, programme the other day called, I think it was Education is Subnormal, I can't remember what it's called. And there is someone, I, I know Joanne knows this person as well, um, Anne Marie was on there. And I mean, she's a social worker now. And when I saw the other day, I gave her a hug and I said, Anne-Marie, I'm so sorry you had to put yourself through that. But she said, I had, to, I had to educate people about the injustice that we suffered. And that's the thing. So what will justice look like? Justice, I mentioned before when I spoke about truth, reconciliation, um, healing and transformation. That's when justice will come. When we admit, just as an alcoholic, I have a problem. And you go through that process to transform society so that there's equal opportunities for everyone. If we live, look at this great city, Birmingham, in which we live, right? We haven't got an MP from the African Caribbean community. We've got a limited number of African Caribbean councillors. And importantly, at strategic level, West Midlands Police do now have, and West Midlands um, Fire Service, do have members from the African Caribbean community at assistant chief level. The point I'm making, however, though, is this. Justice will only come when the mindset of those who think they are greater than us is removed. Because remember the discrimination that the Windrush generation faced and their descendants, of which I'm one of them, the discrimination has been ongoing and has never gone away. And until we admit that Britain has a race issue, we're never going to go anywhere. Tomorrow there's an article in the Birmingham Mail, which I've written, asking one simple question. Why do we, as British people, find it difficult to talk about racism when last year we were taking one knee when George Floyd died? It's easier for us to talk about America 
what is not very easy at all for us to do, go through the process of self-examination. Thank you very much. I think um, that is, a, again, a clear call to action that there needs to be um, greater reflection about what is happening on our own doorstep, um, as opposed to um, only focusing on things that happen elsewhere. It's, um, it's more of a comfortable conversation when you're focused on something which seems far away um, yeah. than with uh, having to look at something which is that you directly can have an impact on. Um, Laura, I think you said that there was another question. Yes, one more question, and this might be like a joint uh, response because it is about education, but there's a question. Um, have any approaches been made uh, to, in, to government about embedding this in the natural curriculum as a statutory element? Just to let you know, Wendy Williams, um, in the Wendy Williams review, Lessons Learned Review, has actually talked about, she doesn't talk about education and curriculum, but she talks about education generally, and importantly, education within the home office. So that seed has been planted. We know a few years ago as well, um, Stephanie Peter um, had a, a petition going to um, have um, Black History placed on the um, education curriculum. And she wasn't talking about when we were kings and queens. She's talking about very more recent history because there was a there was recognition that recent history impacts on our lives from here and now. And people don't understand history. And importantly as well, they don't understand that all important journey as well. Now, in terms of the work that we're doing, and I touched on that in a presentation as well with Churches Together, for the Commonwealth Games. And it's something that I will be talking to Joanne about as well. There you go, a bit more work for you. But you'll love this one to get your teeth into it. And anyone else on this call who wants to join in, I'll communicate to Joanne, is that we want to run projects in schools on heroes and unsung heroes. So I've mentioned people like Lord Bill Morris, there's Lenny Henry, for example. But then, you know, our, our grandparents, my father used to work at Parkinson and Cowan. Many people won't say, well, what's that? Today it's known as a new sea, Electrolux. But you know, that's where he worked. There were some of our people who worked at Dunlop, some worked at British Leyland. Aren't they heroes as well? There's a car driving around with an engine in there that I'm sure my father-in-law casted, for example, at Longbridge. So, you know, and but what's that doing is it's actually educating our people. You know, when, when you put two P into your gas meter, for example, and someone else nicked your bath. It sounds trivial, but that was life at that time. When there was no gas, you had a paraffin heater, you put your frying pan on top of the paraffin heater to fry an egg. It sounds trivial, but it's actually not. It's because our youngsters need to have that sense of belonging, but also as well, sense of understanding of the hardship it took for them to wear night trainers today. I'm being very blunt, but that's where we need to be so that if they do wear their night trainers to school that they're not supposed to be wearing, at least they'll have an appreciation of the blood, sweat and tears it took through generations for them to have that. So education is absolutely crucial. And it's something that through the WNO, we're gonna be um, campaigning into the home office to ask that it be placed on the school curriculum because we do need to have that there. Because if it was there, maybe the Windrush scandal would never have happened. Definitely. Um, I look forward to our conversations coming up, Des, um, yes, about, especially about the Commonwealth Games. I think it is an absolutely amazing opportunity. Um, it's going to be in Birmingham. Um, we want everybody to get involved in that and for the schools to be involved in terms of sharing the stories of the Commonwealth. Lots of young people do not know anything about the Commonwealth whatsoever. And um, I think it is an actually an opportunity to unify um, that we should really grab hold of for sure. Um, Laura, any other questions? Uh, no more questions, but I'm just maniacally smiling and nodding along to those projects. And it just made me personally feel like a bit emotional, really, actually, because I would have loved to have had a project at school where I could go away and bring a picture of my grandma and talk about where she worked and, and my aunts and uncles who came over from Antigua at one at a time because she was sending money home. Like, I'd have been so proud to come to school and talk about that. Um, and They've had children bring their grandparents who might be able to talk about the world wars and, and their family history. And I, I also have that on, on the other side of my family. But I just thought how, yeah, I really feel a bit choked actually hearing that and how like 
what wonderful experience that would be for the children that can be involved in that. So anything that we can do to spread the word and get more people involved, I would love to um, to be involved in that as well. Great. Well, it will be all inclusive. That's all I can say. Well, look, this isn't about um, bringing bringing in the hierarchy. This is really about going to grassroots and bringing in people who want to make a difference because this whole project will be about making a difference. And the Commonwealth Games is the ideal opportunity to have this, particularly through churches together. And just to let you know, that is a committee which is ultimately chaired, chaired by Bishop Mike Boyle from the Cinnamon Network. But it's actually um, it's actually overseen by the um, Bishop of Birmingham as well. So we've been sure that there's enough clout there from the House of Lords to ensure that whatever we want, we get. And that's, uh, that's how we're having to do things now. Because sadly, we do live in a society where, sadly, something I don't believe in, it's who you know. And, um, but you know, the facts are if we use those connections in a positive way, it means that as a community, we advance um, in a much quicker way. Yeah, thank you. And Laura, um, I echo what you're saying about being able to share our own stories. Um, lots of people, their grandparents, their parents um, made huge contributions um, in this country and never ever acknowledged, and never had the opportunity. Um, and there have in the past been some really nice photographic exhibitions and things like that. But like everything else, funding comes, funding goes, and, and um, lots of the archives and the resources around that um, do not exist anymore. So I think anything that we do, we want to make sure that it's something that's permanent, that it's accessible for years to come, um, so that lots of generations of young people will be able to use those resources and just had to have that knowledge. There's been little pockets of really great work that's done, but it, um, as often with these things, that don't last and we want to make sure that, that that doesn't happen again. Now I know that there's some great comments in the chat. Um, there may be some other questions just in the last couple of minutes. Um, or uh, just if there are any um, standout comments for you, for you, Laura, that you could share. Uh, yeah, just one that um, actually came from Lucy in the chat, just talking about, again, the, the, kind of the idea of this, this project with the Commonwealth is that kind of sense of belonging that's needed across the country slash the world, really, right now. And, and actually, um, Anne um, also in the chat spoke earlier about that um, sense of community and importance to some of the um, those that came over in the Midwest generation that's not necessarily what we're experiencing kind of nowadays, that people have maybe drifted apart or the history's been lost and that connection's not really um, there for some. Yeah, just that kind of, there's a lot of, yeah, chat about, it's just essential for young people, but how do we bring back that sense of community in this digital world where you can feel far away and close all at the same time. So yeah, lots of like, it just resonates a lot and for people. Fantastic, thank you. Um, well, I think we've got about, um, about five minutes or so. Um, do you have any um, final reflections at all, um, Desmond? And, um, or maybe in particular, just an update about some of the cases that you've been working on. I know that you um, went to Jamaica um, to support a young man as well who had been um, deported uh, and, and that was quite widely shared. Um, via social media, et cetera. And lots of people have asked subsequently, um, you know, if there were any updates on, on some of the cases that you worked on, just to put things into a um, current day context. Well, just to bring, bring things right up to date, in terms of those cases, one thing we've got to understand is um, that when, once someone's deported, the government dragged their feet. The Home Office, the Immigration Service, they just dragged their feet. They're, they're, in, they're not in a rush. Um, to have anyone return. The only time that happens is once you get it into court, but they've got to do the go through their processes before you can actually even apply for a court date. So in case of Marlon, who we're talking about here, there are applications which I, which I understand have been made by his legal team for him to return to the UK. But in the meantime as well, his children are going to Jamaica and spending a certain amount of time with him there as well. I think the saddest part of Marlon's case is how they handled his deportation because he just went to report his daughter's at school, daughter's living with him. There we go, a father who's looking after his daughter. But they didn't care. They detained him and said, children's services will go and collect your child. That's wrong. And what we're trying to stress to the Home Office, although when it comes to dealing with that side, we still make representations. 
But we're saying to the Home Office, suspend the hostile environment. They're still rather reluctant to do it at the moment. But the deaf ears it fell on initially, they do take a little bit of notice now, as we've seen in the recent case of Osme from um, and Dudley. They have listened. And I mean, that case, they've abandoned making any further representations in that particular court case. Now, to let you know, in terms of engagement, Joanne, because I think that's the important thing here, engagement is getting a lot better now with the Home Office to degree where at our last meeting, which is on Zoom on the last, the third Thursday of every month, the Windrush National Organization hosts a public engagement meeting with the Home Office. Um, at the previous meeting, was, which was a status meeting, that was May's meeting, we actually had the head of operations on the call from Liverpool. Now that's significant because he runs that immigration office in Liverpool along with status decision makers. Now, interesting enough, we had about three cases that have been gone going for two years. If I tell you they were resolved within 10 days of that meeting. Now, the meeting we just had, which was a compensation meeting for June, um, we had decision makers on from the compensation scheme, so very high level um, civil servants. However, we had a very significant civil servant on there, and she was the um, um, director general of the Passport and Immigration Service. So apart from her, you can't be above her as a PPS and um, Priti Patel. So clearly, we're making progress there and they're coming to these meetings and they are facing the community, um, sometimes a little bit jittery, but they are facing the community and they are taking the questions. And what we do now is we record these, we place them on our website, but the, all the questions that are asked in the chat, some, some meetings have been a hundred questions. We submit them to the Home Office and they provide written answers. So we're turning our national organization's website into a point of reference now, because these are live answers not standard answers, which are placed there by the Home Office as well. So overall, are we making progress? Yes. Is it quick enough? No, it isn't. But are we moving in a direction which is more positive for our community? Yes, we are. Is there a lot of work to be done? Of course there is. Thank you. I'm very pleased to hear that there is some um, progress being made, but we do know that the, the kind of the wheels of justice um, turn incredibly slow. Um, but thank, thank you again for all of the work that you're doing, your organisation is doing in terms of supporting um, those um, who have been affected and um, just continually keeping um, that um, pressure going, because without that, um, we know that uh, lots of this progress would be quite stagnant. So um, we're going to bring our um, special Windrush Day um, so we're going to bring it to a close now. Thank you, everybody who has attended. Um, Desmond, thank you so much for being thank with you. us. Dr. Amma for being with us earlier. Um, Laura, I know that um, we have still, we've got some comments that we'll have a look at. We'll get back to all of you um, via Dr. Amma or Desmond if you have any questions that you wish to put to them. Um, this recording will be made available um, soon, within a couple of days. Um, and so when that is available, we'll be sharing it widely um, so that others can take part. And again, um, that call to all of us as educators, um, let's ensure that the stories of the Windrush generation are celebrated and told um, to ensure that we can remove some of the ignorance um, which is still prevailing in our society today. So thank you again to everybody. Um, Laura, thank you so much for all of your support. Des, thank you again. Thanks and very much. to everyone, have a good afternoon and a good Windrush Day. Many thanks. Bye-bye.